to say thank you. Dennis Waitley was, uh, is a uh, motivational speaker, writer, consultant. He's consulted with NASA astronauts. He's consulted with Fortune 500 business leaders. He's consulted with professional athletes, gold, Olympic gold medalists. He's consulted with POWs when they return home. He studied conditions that they've uh, all gone through in their conditioning and in their training. But he once said to this group, he said, happiness cannot be traveled to, it cannot be owned, earned, warned, or consumed. Because happiness is a spiritual experience of living every minute with love, grace, and gratitude. That love, that uh, happiness is a spiritual experience of living every moment with grace, love, and gratitude. I believe that's, that's so true. He... Uh, other writers have once said that the virtue, the uh, greatest of all virtues is gratitude because it determines the happiness and contentment in our life. So if grace and gratitude are so critical, so critical to our living, our health, our emotions, and uh, studies have been done over the years, over and over again, that not only does it help our dealing with stress and our, our emotions, but also our physical health. And if it's so important that grace and gratitude have that function in our life, then maybe we should figure out the practices that create that gratitude and that grace and make that a part of an everyday lifestyle instead of a yearly event for a few hours at most. I mean, we get really warm and fuzzy and, you know, we, somebody says the prayer and we're thankful and then, man, it's through dessert and it's to um, the uh, football games and then it's Black Friday and then where it's a race to the end of the year and all of a sudden, this gratitude notion is in the mirror view mirror when it never really should have been about just an event or a holiday but it should be a lifestyle of a moment-by-moment -moment experience of the grace, love, and gratitude that God can give us. It's so important that we have that kind of disposition, and it has to be chosen, just as Pastor Chris said. It's, you know, there's a lot of people think, well, when I feel grateful, then I will be grateful. But you know what? It's, that's the wrong way to look at it. It's not, um, it's not um, happy people that are grateful. It's grateful people that will find happiness. It's an action that produces a feeling. It's just like love. There's some people that you're going to struggle to love, but when you start acting loving toward them, pretty soon you go, you know, really, they're not so bad. Now, I know, I know, you've got in-laws that are exceptions to that rule, but other than that, it generally works. That when you act in loving ways, suddenly the people you didn't really care so much for, you start having a little different feeling toward them. Feelings always follow the action not the other way around. There's lots of reasons that we forget about gratitude. I mean, we, we live busy lives, don't we? We have a lot of stress. We have a lot of things that happen that, um, you know, are negative. Bad things do happen. My gosh, this area of the country has experienced a lot of that in the last few months. On the West Coast, too. But, you know, sometimes the things that take away from us being daily grateful and saying thank you. Uh, one of the things is privileged upbringing. Now, some of you are going, well, that's none of us here. Oh, you know what? Compared to the rest of the world, every single one of us have had privileged upbringings. All you have to do, you don't even have to travel outside our country to know that, but if you travel outside this country, you find people that would love to have our problems. They would love to have what we call shortages. So in a way, we're privileged in our upbringing. But I know even in the U.S., Privileged upbringing has spoiled this sense of gratitude by a lot of people. I mean, when kids get trophies for just being there, you know, and kids can't get a bad grade because, well, that might damage them. Well, they might ought to get their little behinds busy studying, you know, and make better grades. So, you know, this whole deal of pamperedness and spoiledness and all that, it goes against raising a generation of people that live with this sense of gratitude and saying thank you. It's kind of odd. I have a friend that really gets offended when he goes to a place and, and um, he do, opens the door for somebody and, and you know, and, and set, uh, or they, do, they serve him in some way and he says, uh, thank you. And instead of going, you're welcome, they go, no problem. I mean, think about that little nuance a little bit. Like, really, could it have been a problem to be nice? I'm not really sure where this is going. And so people grow up because of our privileged upbringing. Thing. Another thing that takes away from that can be affluent experiences. Again, compared to the rest of the world, 
we have quite a lot of that. And affluent experiences kind of make the normal not look so good, right? I mean, have you ever, have you ever been on a cruise? Any of you ever been on a cruise? Any, any of you ever been to a res, nice resort? Like for a weekend away with the your sweetheart or something? Been to a nice resort? Well, I mean, you've been a, on a cruise or a nice resort or you know, up to Callaway Garden or something like that. An evening at the Budget Inn over there in Union Springs just might not bring up the same feelings. I'm just saying. Never stayed there, but I just kind of wonder. I've been by there. Right? Food. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know where your favorite steak place is. Have you ever eaten at Conestoga down in Dothan? Uh, that's pretty good, right? Pretty good food. You know, once you've had a steak there, or if you go to the big city and eat at Fleming's or Ruth's Chris, I want to just tell you, don't worry about ordering the ribeye at Chili's. You know, you're just not going to, it's not going to be the same experience. You know, I was at Chili's one time, and this lady was just giving the server fits. She's like, you know what? This steak is not what I ordered. And first of all, I'm going, you ordered a steak at Chili's? And she said, she's railing on this poor waitress. She said, you know what, lady? I know my steaks, and this is not a ribeye. And I just wanted to say, honey, why did you order a steak at Chili's? Get their ribs or their hamburger or their salad, but don't get a steak at Chili's. Go a couple of doors down to Conestoga and get a real piece of meat. Right? So, you know, it's all about comparison, and we know how that comparison thing works. This lady left unhappy. She didn't get a refund, and so, well, you know, I really believe, generally speaking, that the more we have, our tendency is we forget about being grateful unless, and here's the catch, unless we are intentional in practicing gratitude, intentional in saying thank you. It'll kill the love, the grace, the gratitude in our hearts if we continually compare our circumstances and our stuff with those around us. Social media has just made, blown that out of proportion, has it not? I mean, you, you know people, they post their stuff about their kids and you'd think they had just fallen from heaven. Well, yeah, some of them are fallen angels, but you know what I mean? They, you read there and you think, man, their kids, they get better grades, they're better looking, they get all these sports trophies, they get all this stuff, and my kids, well, you know, they're here. Their husband's more romantic, their wife's better looking, their house is bigger and newer, they must have more money. Never occurs to us they might have more debt. They have a vacation home. Well, you may have a home. That's good. They have the latest car. You know, there's always going to be someone that has more than us, nicer than us. And that's why it's so important to counter these hindrances to gratitude. But, it, but you know, and why is it? Because it honors God. But besides it honoring God, and that is first and foremost, what I've found is if I begin to practice thankfulness and saying thank you, It'll reduce my stress, and it'll increase my emotional health. That's been proven scientifically, by the way. It's been proven that it will relieve our stress, reduce our stress, and increase our emotional health by saying thank you and showing gratitude. The hu healthiest human emotion you'd think is love because of the movies and the songs and all that, and yet... Really, the healthiest human emotion is gratitude. I've actually read where it raise, increases our immunities to be grateful. People who are grateful are happy. More than happy people are grateful. So where do you start cultivating and practicing gratitude? Well, I think first and foremost, and it shouldn't be a surprise to people that come to church, is that we need to come to terms with the gra uh, grace of God in our lives. To come to terms with it. You see, it's receiving a gift. Grace is a gift. We can't earn it. There's people that knock themselves out trying to earn God's love and God's favor. And they end up empty all the time. Grace can't be earned. It can't be uh, worked for. It's a free gift of God, and it's a gift we haven't earned. That's the difference of grace and mercy. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve, and grace is getting what we didn't deserve, and God offers both grace and mercy 
to each of us in abundance. One of the, my favorite stories is in uh, the Gospels where Jesus was invited to one of the Pharisees' house for dinner. I mean, if you know anything about reading the New Testament, about reading the Gospels, have ever read about Jesus, you know that that was a minefield in and of itself for Jesus to go to the house of a Pharisee. You know what a Pharisee was? They were somebody that were holier than everybody else in their own mind. They were the ones that said, well, at least I'm not like that person. At least I don't do this. And they just thought they were on a higher plane and closer to God. So one of them invited Jesus over for a dinner, and there was a woman that didn't have like the best reputation, shall we say, that came to the dinner. And when the Pharisee saw, uh, who had invited Jesus, saw this woman come into the dinner, he said to himself, if this man, Jesus, were a prophet, he would have known what kind of woman it is touching him. You may remember the story. She poured oil, uh, began to wash his feet and dry his feet with her hair. I know in our society that'd be a little weird, right? You know, I, and if I go your house and some lady comes up and starts, you know, washing my feet and drying it with her hair, I'm probably going to grab my coat and run. That's a little different. In that, in that day and time and in that culture, that was a courtesy. And this woman of ill repute came in and did that. And then she uh, uh, kissed his feet. And then she anointed his head with this oil. And in that day and time, in that arid climate, putting oil on the face was a, was a gesture. It was a courtesy and it was uh, refreshing. And so she was showing this kind of appreciation and love for Jesus. And um, so G Simon becomes incensed and says, man, if he really was a prophet, he'd know what this woman's been up to. And Jesus answered his thoughts. And that's kind of scary, isn't it? I mean, it's one thing for him to answer our foolish statements, but it's another thing when he reads our mind. Have you ever been around someone you felt like they, were just, they could see right through you? It's a little unnerving, isn't it? And so Jesus answered his thought and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, go ahead, teacher. Jesus told him a story, which he often did. He said, a man loaned uh, money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces of silver to the other, but neither of them could uh, uh, repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Well, Simon wasn't stupid. He answered and he said, I suppose the one whom he canceled the larger debt, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said, that's right. And then he turned to this woman and he said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your house, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Simon, you didn't greet me with a kiss, which was common in that culture. But from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You, Simon, neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she's anointed my feet with rare perfume. And Jesus said, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, Jesus said, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. And then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Now I got to tell you, there was a time in my life where I thought, when I read that, I thought, wow, then I need to go out and sin grandly in order to love Jesus more. I mean, that's kind of what you read that and you think, wow, man, I need to go really live some. And that's not at all the point. In fact, we don't have to go looking for sin, and we don't have to go looking to sow some wild oats, and we don't have to go looking to have a wild life in order to have a lot of love for God's grace. We need it every single day. See, we often focus on the big sins and the big failures, you know, the major ones that everybody gets all wigged out about, and yet there are no big ones and little ones with God. Just like the Bible says, we all miss the mark. We fall just a little short. We fall short of our, our own standards a lot of times. How much more do we fall short of God's standards? So we're daily. His compassions never fail. That's why we need them daily to cover us. We need them daily to experience. There's a direct link between the depth of my gratitude and my understanding of God's grace in my life. The more grace I realize I've received, 
the more gratitude I'm going to show. And you know what? The more gratitude I feel toward God, here's how it plays out. It's one thing to feel gratitude, but it's not just a feeling. It's an action. And for me to say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for air to breathe. Thank you, God, for hands to, to move and do things with. Thank you, God, for all these different things instead of just feeling a warm fuzzy toward our circumstances. The more grace I've received, the more gratitude I'll show. And you know what? The more grace I've received, the more grace I'll cut to other people. That's how we know if we've really recognized the grace we've received. Is if we're willing to let God be gracious to other people that we don't think measure up. That may be why some churches and denominations and religions seem so stuffy and uninviting. Because we think we're the chosen and everybody else aren't as good. That doesn't happen at South Point. But there are churches that way. When our hearts have been transformed by God's grace and we're filled with gratitude, we'll express it in loving acts and in generous deeds. That's what this story about Simon the Pharisee teaches us. But sometimes we may not really understand how much God's grace has been shown in forgiving us our sins. And we may see ourselves not as bad as other people. And when I realize how much God has forgiven me, how much he has loved me, and how much he has given to give me his grace that I don't deserve, my soul begins to grow in love toward God, in love toward other people, in grace and in gratitude. As a parent, let me ask you, um, have you ever, have any of your kids ever gotten testy? Every day. <laughs> Every day, okay, that's some honesty, right? Every kid on the planet's gotten testy and, you know, pampered and they think they, you know, they get an attitude, even the best kids, even my brother, you know, he was, he had his times. And um, I, I told Dallas I was going to dig deep, bro, so... Your kids have gotten testy before and grumbling about what they didn't get. You know, I wanted this, you didn't get this for me. Disappointed at Christmas or birthdays or whatever. And as a parent, have you ever been that righteous one that just finally had enough and just said, um, start listing the things that you've provided and they take for granted? And if you've got young kids and you haven't gotten there yet, just wait. It's coming. And you go to them and, you know, hey, son, daughter, that room that you say is yours, uh, whose room is that really? Who provided that room? And that room, uh, th those clothes you wear that you're complaining about because they're not the newest label, uh, I mean, who, whose are they really? Right? And um, that TV in your room, that computer in your room, uh, who, by the way, whose is that really? Son, daughter? And um, that cell phone that you're wanting an upgrade for? Whose phone is that, really? To put it in biblical theological terms, it's all theirs by grace. Your grace. Your love. Or you just wanted to shut them up. One of the, you know, I'm just trying to give you the benefit here. I wonder, though, here's what I'm thinking. I wonder if God ever wants to have that kind of conversation with us. And that's kind of scary when I think about that. Well, he'd say, hey, Phil, you know that job you have? What if you didn't have it? By the way, Phil, who, who provided you the means to get that job? And, and who gave you the skill that would get you hired in that job? Who, whose is that really, Phil? You know those kids of yours? Yeah, God. You know who's, uh, that's grace. Thank you, God. You know that mental ability you have, or that emotional stability? Okay, I know that's a stretch for some. Emotional stability, a grace from God. Your health, even if it's not what you want, it's better than a lot. Grace from God. That food that you were able to buy and cook today, the grace of God. You know, I was privileged to go to Africa some years ago, to, to Kenya, to help with an orphanage. And that'll never leave me, that experience. And you don't have to go overseas to see this. You can go here in the country, different places. But we had traveled. It was a long, arduous trip and got to the hotel in Nairobi. And um, 
you know, it was the one, it was like the second best hotel, and you guys, tell, those of you who have traveled overseas, that doesn't mean a lot. And so we lay down on that bed, exhausted, and it was like laying on this platform. And I started grumbling on a missions trip. I know, not my finest hour. The next day, we went to see the kids. And they lived in a compound in one of the better areas that looked like a bombed-out slum, and that was one of the better areas. And we went in, and we saw where they lived. And we were there to help build them another place. And, all, and these were orphans whose parents had died from AIDS. And they, um, everything they had was in a cubby about, I don't know, 10 by 10 inches, maybe. And they had twin beds, you know, like sleeps, sleeps one, and two kids per bed. And their food was cooked on an open fire outside, and it was beans and rice or rice and beans just about every meal. Sometimes they mixed it up, beans and rice, rice and beans. So, And you know what? We went out and took them for a picnic and played with them, and we, all, we had one soccer ball. And you know what? Those kids laughed, and they danced, and they ran, and they played. And then they were glad to go home and get in that twin bed with their bunk mate. In their bathroom was a hole in the floor. And I tell you what, I went back to that motel room that night so ashamed of myself. And it never left me because every time I think about, well, this isn't what I want. This is not exactly what I was hoping for. I think about people all around this world that are just so thankful for anything that comes their way. And it's made me more, pr more prone to say thank you to God and thank you to others who extend me grace that I didn't earn and I didn't, uh, uh, didn't deserve, but out of grace was given me. Another part of practicing gratitude is to learn how to practice it in all circumstances of life. God said in his word, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will to you who belong in Christ Jesus. You know why we can be thankful in all circumstances? doesn't mean they're good circumstances. There's lots of bad circumstances. Some of you are facing some bad circumstances. Some of you have some dread for this next week or right after the holidays because of circumstances that are not of your choosing but we can still be thankful in those circumstances because we know God has a bigger purpose than the problem we're facing. And we know that God will give us the power to overcome that problem. And we know that we'll grow through the experience if we trust God to help us. And you may be thinking to yourself, Phil, you don't know my circumstance. How can I be grateful when I've lost so much? Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe you lost your career. Maybe you've lost a loved one to death. Maybe you lost a loved one through divorce or infidelity. Maybe you've lost your health. Maybe you're not quite where you used to be. And the key to living grateful in grace and love and gratitude every day is not to focus on what you've lost, but to focus on what you have left. Chris one time gave us an exercise. He may have done it here in church, but he did it with the staff. And he gave us a sheet of paper with the alphabet, A to Z, and challenged us to go through the alphabet and thank God for something that associated with each letter of the alphabet. Seems kind of elementary, doesn't it? But it's not. It's just another tool to remind us of how much we have to say thank you for. Max Lucado says it this way, that gratitude is a dialysis of sorts. It flushes the self-pity out of our systems, saying thank you. You know, some people think, and I'll wrap it up with this, that some people think that the original sin, you know, back in the garden, Adam, Eve, the fruit, the snake, the serpent, whatever, that that, the original sin, there's a lot of debate on what original sin is, and someone has suggested that it's the sin of ingratitude, that the sin of um, ingratitude, you think about it, who knows, it may be. Adam and Eve had millions of reasons to say thank you, didn't they? Have you ever read the creation story? 
I mean, if you never read it, you saw it in Sunday school somewhere, all the little pictures. You know, all the animals, and they didn't bite. You know, all the animals, they didn't sting. They were in perfect harmony with everything. They had all this beautiful, lush garden, all these trees, all this fruit, all these vegetables, everything they could ever want. And in its perfect order, they didn't have mosquitoes. I don't think they had mosquitoes. I guess that's open for theological debate. I don't know. But they had everything in that garden they could possibly want, and they were happy. And God liked it so much, in the cool of the day, he came down to the garden to take a walk. That's how good it was. And one day, the serpent entered the picture. And he pointed out to them, he's like, you know, y'all think you got it so good. What about that one tree over there that God said, don't touch it. And instead of them going, yeah, but look at all that we can touch, somehow discontentment entered the picture in Eve's mind and heart. And suddenly, they felt like God was holding something back. Now, I'm not blaming Eve. Ladies, don't, get that. don't let ever anybody put that off on you. A a a Adam was a willing participant. In fact, a friend of mine said if Adam had got up and got his own snack, we wouldn't be in this mess today. So there is a point to that. True. But discontent entered the picture like a bully on the playground. And everything fell apart after that. They focused on the single thing they didn't have instead of the millions of things they did have. And all of a sudden, Eden wasn't enough anymore, even though it really was more than enough. Now, think about this, and this is the point I want to leave you with going home. Think about this. If, what if gratitude had won the day in the garden way back then? What if instead of when the serpent came and said, you know, you don't have that tree over there. What if they had said, oh, but thank God for all we do have. Look what he has provided for us. Look at all the fruit and the vegetables and the beautiful animals and, you know, all this wonderful place that God's provided for us. What if gratitude had won the day, that day in Eden? Would our world be different right now? Well, we'll never know but let me make it more personal as we leave here today. If gratitude and saying thank you won the day for you today, would your day be any different? If this next week you focused on saying thank you as often as you possibly could, do you think your life would be any different each and every day? That thing you're going through, as bad as and as painful as it is, do you think if you could find ten things a day to say thank you for, do you think your life might be different to that day? I think it's worth a shot. And I think saying thank you to God and to those that he uses to bring these blessings to your life could be a big start in making a whole different life for you going forward. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your amazing, amazing grace and love. And Lord, we don't have to look far to see how deeply your love runs and how deeply we're in need of your grace and your mercy and your love. Lord, help us all to not look at the one thing that we've lost, but to look at all that we have left. Help us not to focus on the things that the world says are important, and, thank, and help us to focus on the things and say thank you for the things that we need for a living. Lord, it's hard. We, we, we fail so often. I do. I pray that you would just remind us. Use things in our life. Use people around us to remind us that we have tons of stuff to say thank you for, that we'll never run out of things to say thank you for. So thank you, Lord. Amen.